Welcome to the regular Friday meeting of the City Club of Portland. I'm Jim Westwood, your president. As is always our custom, I will begin the meeting by introducing two new members who are seated at the new member table and uh, ask them to stand. Please uh, hold your applause till I've introduced both of them. First, we have Laura Maisel, an associate at Stoll Reeves, Bowley, Jones, and Gray, and David Meyer, an attorney in practice in Portland. Are you here? Ah, yes, in the line. Welcome to City Club. Thanks also to the recruiter of these people, Dick Roy. Next Friday, December 20th, please mark your calendars for that. It's a special City Club function. Join us for City Club's annual holiday program. It's always a joy and a delight to, to attend that. It's presented each year by the City Club's Arts and Culture Standing Committee, and this year it's a special one even more than perhaps usually. It features the Maranatha Messengers, Oregon's most renowned gospel choir. They'll perform a medley of seasonal and gospel songs. Members are invited to bring family and friends to this special program. There's something in this program for everyone. Member prices will apply to everyone, guests included. And the lunch, which is always a special one put on by the Benson, will feature holiday fare. That will be at the Benson Hotel here in the Mayfair Room next Friday, December 20th, City Club's annual special Christmas program. Members, guests, families, all welcome. Friday, December 27th, by tradition, there'll be no regular City Club Friday program, but please have a happy and safe Christmas. We reconvene on Friday, January 3rd, and our speaker then will be Susan Tolley, MD, Director of the Center for Ethics and Healthcare at Oregon Health Sciences University. She'll speak on medical ethics and healthcare decisions that patients and physicians face in the instances of terminal illness or catastrophic injury, a timely and important topic. Certainly that's Friday, January 3rd, Susan Tolley here at City Club. That too will be here at the Benson Hotel in the Mayfair Room. You'll note in your bulletins over the last several weeks there have been acknowledgments of gifts to the City Club's annual fund. To all of you who have contributed, let me say thank you. Without your support, City Club as we know it would certainly not be able to continue. Membership dues make up only a small portion, about 65% of the City Club's budget. Membership has been declining, so we're now only halfway to our $35 annual fund goal, and it's more important than ever that we reach that, reach that goal. If you haven't yet made your contribution to the City Club annual fund, please put the City Club on your list for year-end giving. A special holiday gift idea for your club friends, and now a special bargain, is the City Club mug. Mugs are on sale today at the back of the room. Special reduced price, $4. They're available for purchase and will be at the end of the program, as I say, at the back of the room, available. Please take advantage of that opportunity to support City Club and to support your friends at the same time and to carry the City Club logo through into the public. Mugs are also available, incidentally, through the club office. Our board host today seated at the head table is Chuck Williams, member of the Board of Governors and manager for medical center communications at Good Samaritan Hospital. He'll, as always, have the privilege of asking the first question of today's speaker. And the second question from the floor will be asked by Pat Donaldson, Chair of the Law and Public Safety Standing Committee. After that, we open the meeting up to questions from members of the audience uh, who are City Club members. Written questions will be permitted as time allows, and there are forms for the written questions on your tables. At the end of our speaker's remarks, please hold up those written questions, and staff will collect them and bring them up to the head table so we can ask them from here. The Bill of Rights of the U.S. Constitution is now 200 years old. It doesn't seem like it's been 200 years, and yet when you look back historically, the Bill of Rights for the first 100 years and more was really pretty much a dead letter. It was not invoked and not cited much by the Supreme Court or other courts in furtherance of any particular human rights. Of course, the 20th century has seen a change in all that. The First Amendment, freedom of religion, speech, press, the other amendments in the Bill of Rights that protect persons from self-incrimination or from unreasonable searches and seizures that guarantee the right to a fair jury trial, all these are now very much alive. But today, the U.S. Supreme Court is showing indications of moving in new directions with regard to the Bill of Rights. There are those who see a trend toward a narrowing of individual rights in a criminal context searches, seizures, statements made after arrest. There are those who see a narrowing of rights of speech 
What is speech? When is speech protected? And yet, at the same time, we see what one could certainly call a broadening of other rights. The rights of citizens of the various states and of the states themselves to do things vis-a-vis -vis the federal government that they were not previously allowed to do. A, what some would see as an expansion of freedom of religion, others would say is a mingling of church and state in what may be a broadening of the, uh, the rights, if you want to call it that, of, of persons, for example, for a moment of silence in public schools. And I think there are some observ observers who see public support for parochial schools, which now is not viewed as permissible under the Constitution, becoming permissible. These and other items I think are going to be discussed by our speaker today, and if ever I was able to stand up here and say, today's speaker really needs no introduction to this audience, I think we're right. Our speaker today, of course, is Charles Hinkle, past president of the City Club, a person well qualified to speak on the Bill of Rights. He's former president of the Oregon affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union and a former member of its national board. He's litigated many cases for the ACLU involving free, free speech, freedom of religion, the death penalty, gay rights, abortion, and others. He has received the ACLU's coveted E.B. McNaughton Award. That was in 1987. Charlie Hinkle is well known to us all. He's currently a partner with the law firm of Stoll, Reeves, Bully, Jones, and Gray. He's also an adjunct professor of constitutional law at Lewis and Clark Law School. I could go on and on, but as I say, he really needs no further introduction to speak to us on and this is a wonderful topic, sex, race, free speech, and the Supreme Court. <laughs> Let's welcome Charlie Hinkle. Well, uh, thank you, Jim. I'm glad you stopped when you did. I thought for a moment there you were going to give my speech. Uh, and I, uh, it is, uh, of course, an honor to be uh, invited to speak to the City Club, and I'm especially pleased to be doing so uh, at this particular Friday program because, uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, we are celebrating the 200th anniversary of the ratification of the Bill of Rights. That happened uh, when Virginia ratified uh, in December 15th, 1791. So two days from now, uh, this Sunday, the December 15th, is actually the, the 200th anniversary. It was a remarkable document when it was written, and it remains a remarkable document today, filled with majestic phrases that are familiar to all of us. Jim mentioned some of them. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to a fair trial, the right to be free from double jeopardy and from self-incrimination and from unreasonable searches. And you might suppose that after 200 years, these principles would have become so embedded in our collective consciousness, so embedded in our shared understanding of how a free people should govern themselves that a 200th anniversary would be the occasion for universal celebration and handshakes all around. But that's not how we find ourselves in this bicentennial year. Words that seemed so simple and so straightforward when we first encountered them, and maybe that's when we were in the eighth grade or thereabouts reading them in a civics text, those words that seemed so simple then turn out to have a lot of different meanings to different people. And that's neither surprising nor troubling, I suppose. But what is troubling is that there are so many Americans who misunderstand or reject the fundamental principle that lies behind the Bill of Rights. These great principles that are set out in these Ten Amendments were enshrined in our Constitution not to protect the majority. Their whole purpose is to protect the powerless, the outsider, the political dissenter, the religious minority, the person involved somehow in a confrontation of one kind or another with government. And what makes this 200th anniversary of the Bill of Rights such a somber occasion for many of us is not that there are so many Americans who misunderstand or reject that principle. It is that so many of them are sitting on the US Supreme Court. <laughs> now, I don't mean to suggest that there is not room for honest disagreement about the meaning of the various clauses in the Bill of Rights. Its phrases are as majestic, as vague as they are majestic. And judges, like all the rest of us, read words, read any words, through the prism of their own experience, according to who they are and where they were born and where they went to school and what books they read and who they associated with and so forth. 
And in one important respect, at least, the members of the court who are sitting there now are like every other member who ever went before them on the Supreme Court. They are able to find in the Constitution ample protection for the rights and values and interests that are important in their own lives. Let me give you an example. When the Supreme Court was asked at the turn of the century whether a state could prevent a factory owner from requiring his employees to work more than 10 hours a day, could a state prohibit that? The answer that those judges gave on the Supreme Court then, well, was of course not. The Constitution protects the businessman's right to run his business as he wishes. They were men of property, those judges, and it was unthinkable to them that the Constitution would not protect the values and choices that were important to men of property. But when a comparable group of justices three decades earlier was asked, can a state prevent a woman from practicing law? The answer was, well, of course it can. The Constitution doesn't protect a woman's right to do anything. They were men of property, those judges. And it was unthinkable to them that the Constitution would protect a woman's right to practice law. It was essentially the same right, the same values that were at stake in both of those cases. But the judges who sat on the Supreme Court a century ago, all men, of course, all white, all privileged, all upper class, those men were unwilling to extend to another group, a powerless group, the same right that they claimed for themselves. <coughs> now, maybe that doesn't surprise you. Maybe that's just part of human nature. We're all prisoners of our own experience after all. And that makes it all the more remarkable perhaps whenever any group of judges is able to break out of the prison of their own experience. But that's what happened in our country for about a half century. In that 50 year period from about 1937 until about 1987, 50 year period when the judges who sat on the Supreme Court, or a good many of them at any rate, began to be able to see beyond the values and the interests of their own class and station in life, and to understand that maybe the Constitution should protect the rights of people who had other values and other interests. So, at first, in the 1930s and 1940s, the protections of the Constitution were extended first to political dissenters, and then to members of minority and unpopular religious groups. Then in the 1950s, it suddenly dawned on the court that the Equal Protection Clause was supposed to apply to African Americans as well as to whites. In the 1960s, the court gave further free speech protection to the right to criticize government, and it demonstrated some understanding of what it is like to be a poor person caught up in the criminal justice system. In the 1970s, the court discovered women. And it recognized for the first time that equal treatment under the law and matters of personal choice relating to marriage and to procreation, that these things were deserving of constitutional protection for women too, just as they always had been for men. In all of these decisions and in many others like them, the court was not creating any new rights. It was ex simply extending the same rights that had always been taken for granted by white upper class males, extending them to other groups who were not rich, who were not white, who were not male, who were not healthy and privileged and comfortable, and who did not belong to the downtown Protestant churches. Now all this began to change in the Reagan years, not overnight of course, but with each new retirement, each new appointment to the court, President Reagan and then President Bush were able to shift the court further and further away from the role it had played for a half century, the role that is of protector of the powerless in our society. During this transition period, conservatives on the court moved cautiously at first because they had to attract the votes of one or two justices in the middle who didn't always share their views. So they had to shade their opinions to some extent, not be as aggressive as they might have wanted to be in other circumstances. But the appointment of Justice David Souter after Justice Brennan retired gave the conservative majority the ability not only to prevail, 
in any case that had any kind of political controversy attached to it, but to prevail without any restraint. With six votes now in his stable, Chief Justice Rehnquist could win even if one of those six broke ranks. So there was no longer any need to accommodate the doubts of any dissenting conservative, any middle of the road viewpoint. And this year, with the addition of Clarence Thomas to the court, there may now be seven votes to further the Rehnquist agenda. And if that's true, the prospect is a chilling one. But wait a minute, you say, what do you mean an agenda? How can the court have an agenda? It has only the power, after all, to decide cases that are brought before it. It's not a legislature. It can't go out to write new laws, just in the abstract, new laws that it would like to see on the books. Well, yes and no. The court is presented with more than 5,000 cases every year, covering the whole gamut of the legal landscape, and it's up to the court itself to decide which one of those it wants to decide every year. So if the court has something that it wants to say on abortion, or on free speech, or on the death penalty, or on affirmative action, it can almost always find a case somewhere in that stack of briefs that it's got, find a case that will allow it to say what it wants to say. There's no way to prove this statistically, of course, but it certainly appears to many people that the present court, more than any other court in memory, is guided by political considerations in, in deciding which cases it will consider each year. No way to prove that, as I said. But what is provable, based on the actual record in these cases, is that the Rehnquist court often reaches out to decide cases on the basis of issues or points of law that no one had asked them to decide. No one in the case had raised. That's what they did in the last decision, last June. In a case involving the kind of evidence that can be presented when a criminal defendant is uh, susceptible to a, the, a sentence of death. The court could have decided that case on very narrow grounds. That's what judicial restraint is all about, after all. That's what Reagan and Bush and President Nixon before him before them said that they wanted in the judges they appointed, judges who would exercise judicial restraint, who wouldn't try to write into the law their own views of what wise social policy might be. But in deciding that death penalty case, Rehnquist and his allies showed no restraint. They didn't decide the case on narrow grounds, but instead used it to overturn two very recent decisions that Rehnquist had dissented from and had, and had disliked from the beginning. None of the parties in this death penalty case had asked the court to reconsider those prior decisions, and the case could have been decided without reconsidering them. But Rehnquist now had the votes to do it, and so much for judicial restraint. Now, there's nothing wrong with overturning precedent, nothing inherently wrong with it. Courts have done it uh, throughout our common law history. But it is galling to watch William Rehnquist ignore all that he has ever said for so many years about the evils of judicial activism, and now to engage in it with such gusto, now that he has enough votes to achieve the results that further his political agenda. Now, what is that agenda? Well, in a nutshell, I think it can be expressed this way. It is to affirm and strengthen the power of the state at, at, at the expense of the rights of the powerless. And notice I do not say at the expense of the rights of the individual. For this court, like the court of a century ago, still manages to find plenty of constitutional protection for the rights and values and interests that are important to individuals of their class and status in society. This court, after all, has strengthened the rights of lawyers to advertise it has given lawyers greater rights to insist that their dues not be used for lobbying on political issues. But poor people whose court-appointed lawyers are incompetent and who give them a lousy defense, they've lost their right to bring their claims of an unfair trial to federal court. This court says that Christian school children have the right to establish Bible study clubs in most public schools. But it says that members of the Native American church have no right to participate in their ancient tradition of using peyote as a holy sacrament. This court says that people who have the education and the sophistication 
and the economic means to have a living will prepared, they have the right to have their will respected and to die with dignity. But poor people, people too poor to have an estate plan, too short-sighted to execute a living will, they have no such right. A century ago, Anatole France wrote sarcastically about what he called the majestic equality of the law, which forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges and to beg in the streets and to steal bread. Well, the court seems to know that passage very well. The trouble is it doesn't seem to realize that it was sarcasm. In short, the rights of the weak and the powerless continue to be diminished by this court while the rights of the powerful continue to be vigorously protected. Now, let me apply that proposition as promised in your bulletin for today to this, these three areas of race and sex and free speech. First, with respect to race. Over the past four decades, the court has repeatedly held that government may take race into account when it seeks to overcome the effects of past racial discrimination. That's what we know in shorthand as affirmative action. And that's what Brown against Board of Education 35 years ago was all about. How could the states attempt to integrate their public school systems if they could not take the racial identity of their students into account? That was affirmative action. The states had to engage in it. The court required them to do so in integrating the public schools. But William Rehnquist disagrees. And with Brennan and Marshall now gone from the court, the way is clear for Rehnquist to rewrite the law in this area as he is attempting to do in so many others. Repeatedly, without exception, Rehnquist votes to strike down every law the court has ever considered that gives any kind of preference to blacks or Hispanics or other minorities, or to women for that matter. And there is more than a touch of hypocrisy in Rehnquist's attitude here. Forty years ago, when he was a law clerk at the Supreme Court, at the time that the court was considering Brown against Board of Education, the desegregation decision, Rehnquist argued that the segregation of black school children was permitted by the Constitution. He saw nothing wrong with it. This was an era, you recall, when there were racial preferences in this country. The country had a racially a racial preference program far more extensive than anything that exists today. It was an era in which one group was routinely given, given preferred status, given preferred access to jobs, given preferred access even to the vote. And William Rehnquist thought that racial preferences at that time were acceptable because the group that was receiving the racial preferences was white males. In recent years, however, he's changed his tune. And whether it is a state university trying to recruit more minority students, or the FCC trying to help minorities compete for new broadcast licenses, or a city council giving a percentage of its construction contracts to minorities, any kind of governmental program at all aimed at giving African Americans a fair share of political power in this country, Rehnquist says that's unconstitutional. I wish William Rehnquist would sometime sit down to talk with August Wilson. I'm sure many of you saw Wilson's play Fences last month at the Performing Arts Center. And you may have read the interview with Wilson that was printed in the program notes. The play takes place in the 1950s and Wilson was asked if the issues confronting black Americans in the 1950s were still with us today. And here's part of what Wilson said in response. I don't think there's been any real progress made. I think the condition of black America in 1991 is worse than in 1957. The question is restoration, if you will, of black Americans' moral personality, which was taken away by slavery. You could kill a slave for a $300 fine. You could castrate him for nothing. There was no penalty against that. Blacks were not recognized as baptizable human beings by the English church. You can transfer this to 1991, Wilson went on. This idea of police brutality. Police brutalize blacks, shoot them in the streets, and you can only do that if the person you are doing it to is not a person, does not have a moral personality. 
Well, those are the thoughts of August Wilson. The current court majority seems utterly blind to that viewpoint. Rehnquist's votes and those of his allies on the court reflect their inability to comprehend the magnitude of the inequality and the injustice that has prevailed in our society. These judges can see social realities only from the norm of their own experience, and they decide cases based on values that are in fact merely reflections of existing power structures. And that brings me to the second topic, the second area of application for all this, these issues relating to gender or sex. Because what I'm talking about here, too, is power, power in our society. I suppose between the Clarence Thomas hearings and the William Kennedy Smith trial, we have had more education and more uh, consciousness raising on the issue of the relationship of power between men and women in our country more in the last six months than we had in the previous century. The Thomas hearings in particular brought into focus the reality of the verbal and the physical harassment that women experience in our society, in the workplace. A survey in the Oregonian two days ago reported that 45% of employed women suffer sexual harassment during their careers. And you may have seen another report in today's paper, this morning's Oregonian, that says sexual harassment is the single most underreported civil rights violation in the workplace. Now, by now, that ought to be old news for us. Old news. Yet it seems to be striking a lot of people as a new discovery. There's a reason for that, I think. And it's not a pretty one. Women who work outside the home are simply not taken as seriously as men are. Their sentences are cut short. Their proposals are dismissed. Their experiences of harassment are trivialized and ignored. Their very words are not given the weight of men's words. Women have to wage a constant battle for respect and for equal treatment. Well, what has this got to do with the Supreme Court? Well, unfortunately, I think it has a great deal to do with it. Rehnquist and his allies treat the interests and the aspirations of women with the same lack of understanding and the same lack of compassion with which they treat the claims of Native Americans or African Americans. And once again, Rehnquist's double standard shows through. In the 1970s, he said that discrimination against women does not violate the Constitution. But now he insists that any discrimination against white males does violate the Constitution. He simply cannot bring himself to understand what the idea of equality is all about in the context of gender discrimination in our society. And I think you see that same insensitivity in the abortion decisions. When you read the opinions of Rehnquist and his allies on this issue of abortion, you find no consideration of the fact that it has always been men who have made the laws that prohibit abortion. They never ask whether women have had proportionate representation in the legislatures that pass those kinds of laws. They never ask whether a state that, ha that prohibits abortion has any other kind of law that imposes any comparable life-saving obligation on men. They never ask whether the state has made any effort to spread the burden of unwanted pregnancy on all of society or whether it is content to leave that burden on the backs of pregnant women. They are simply unable or unwilling to see the world from anyone else's point of view and they never ask themselves what kind of laws there would be if the power to make laws were in the hands of someone other than people like themselves, white and male and privileged and comfortable. Then thirdly, with respect to free speech, the one case I want to mention here is also from last term. It provides another illustration, I think, of the limited vision of these judges. The owners of the Kitty Cat Lounge in South Bend, Indiana, wanted to feature new dancing in their club. There was a state public indecency statute in Indiana that might have prevented that, seemed to prevent it. And so the owners of the Kitty Cat Lounge went to court to challenge it. 
The Court of Appeals in Chicago agreed with them, said the law was unconstitutional, and threw it out, said you can go ahead and have your nude dancing. But the Rehnquist majority disagreed. They upheld the law. The Kitty Cat Lounge lost. Rehnquist conceded that nude dancing was entitled to some First Amendment protection, but, he said, this statute isn't aimed at dancing. It's aimed at nudity. And the state's interest in morality is strong enough that it outweighs any free speech rights that the Kitty, Cla Kitty Cat Lounge might have had. Well, what do you do then? If this statute in Indiana is aimed at nudity, what do you do if you are a theater owner who wants to bring to South Bend or to Indianapolis a production of M. Butterfly, or Six Degrees of Separation, or Equus, or Hair, or any one of the many other Broadway plays over the last 20 years that have had a moment or two of nudity in them? Well, never fear. Justice Souter, who cast the deciding vote to uphold the statute, wrote a separate opinion, said he recognized that problem. He said it's only nudity in an adult theater that causes harmful effects in, the, in society, and therefore it's only that kind of nudity that the statute prohibits. So it's OK to bring hair or equus to the Civic Auditorium. It's just the kitty cat lounge that can't have nude dancing in its club. This has led one First Amendment scholar to observe that in this court's view, nude dancing is OK, but naked dancing is not. <laughs> or as someone else has put it, if the audience is drinking white wine, nudity is OK, but if they're drinking beer, it's got to go. <laughs> now, it is easy to satirize that opinion, but the point is a very serious one. Whether the subject is race or gender or free speech, the Rehnquist court over and over again betrays an inability to see the world from any viewpoint but its own, to see the world as it is seen by those whose rights it is disregarding. If you read the peyote case, you will learn very little about the Native American church. You will learn very little about why peyote is central to the relationship between Native American worshipers and their faith. If you read the decisions that involve the abortion rights of minors, you will look in vain for any hint that the justices and the majority have the slightest understanding for what it must be like to be 15 years old, poor, frightened, alone, and pregnant. You can read the latest affirmative action decision, the one involving the city of Richmond a couple of years ago, and you will learn that blacks just don't have the desire to be in the building trades. That's what the majority said. That's why they don't get municipal construction contracts. And then you can read this new dancing and you will find nothing that shows the slightest understanding of or sympathy for the millions of Americans whose cultural world does not extend to the symphony or the ballet. So this won't come as a surprise to you. I think it's time for change. In particular, I think the underrepresentation of women in the corridors of power in our country has got to stop. And I'd like to see the Constitution amended in ways that would bring an end to this underrepresentation of women. So my amendment would require each state to send one man and one woman to the United States Senate. My amendment would limit members of the House of Representatives to, more, to no more than four two-year terms, and it would require that no seat could be filled by a member of either sex for more than eight years in a row. And with respect to the Supreme Court, my amendment would say that every other appointment every alternating appointment must be given to a woman, and that justices could serve terms of only 12 years or so, so that eventually every president during her term of office would be able to appoint one, two, or three members of the court so that no, just, no president could ever again pack the court with persons of one political ideology. I think we'd be a better country if we had these kinds of reforms. I think it would make a difference not only on women's issues, but on race and free speech issues as well. And I think that not because I think women are less capable of racial prejudice than men, or because women make better First Amendment scholars than men, but because I believe that persons who have experienced the reality of powerlessness in our society 
are much more likely to interpret the Constitution in ways that protect the powerless, which is what I believe it was intended to do. And I don't expect my proposals to be enacted tomorrow. But until they are, or if they never are, there are still things, it seems to me, that we can do and must do here in our own community to redress the imbalance of power between the sexes here in our community. I think there can no longer be any justification for the power structure of our city where few women sit in the corporate boardrooms and few women are executives at major corporations and few women are the leading spokespersons for any profession. It is no longer satisfactory for white men to respond to this situation simply by saying, well, we won't join clubs that are all male anymore or we won't attend functions sponsored by groups that discriminate against women. And we'll give a few dollars here and there to various interest groups that work for equal rights and equal treatment between the sexes. I think it's time for white men to affirmatively step aside and to say to themselves, I may believe that I am the best qualified human being on the face of this planet to run this corporation or to run this law firm or to run this accounting firm or to run this city or to hold this office, whatever it might be. But I am willing to give up some power for the sake of achieving a society where power is shared proportionately by all people, regardless of race or gender. For the plain fact is that stereotypes about blacks and stereotypes about women in our society will continue to affect the way that they are treated by the dominant white male majority and by our courts until the day that blacks and women share power in sufficient numbers to dispel once and for all the stereotypes that plague them. A year before he left the court, William Brennan wrote these words in a dissenting opinion. We are not an assimilative homogeneous society, but a facilitative pluralistic one in which we must be willing to abide someone else's unfamiliar or even repellent practice because the same tolerant impulse protects our own idiosyncrasies. That generous vision of America is now absent from the court. Brennan is gone, Thurgood Marshall is gone, and we are left with a court populated mostly by small-minded mediocrities. Will Clarence Thomas bring a change to this? I said a while ago I have my doubts, but others are optimistic. When Thomas was nominated last summer, the dean of the Yale Law School wrote a column for the New York Times, and I want to read part of it to you. Dean Calabrese said this, the present court is outrageously homogeneous. It is overwhelmingly made up of gray Republican political hangers-on of virtually identical backgrounds. They all bring to the court the same life experience and lack thereof. How can they know what discrimination really means, said the dean? How can they understand what fear of police, prosecutorial, or state abuse and brutality is when these justices babble that coerced confessions don't necessarily make trials unfair, when they say that discrimination must be proved in individual cases and not through statistics, when they say that a single appeal is adequate even if the criminal defendant is served by a lousy lawyer, they sound like what they really are. People who neither through personal experience nor academic thought could ever imagine themselves erroneously crushed by the power of the state. And then the dean concluded, Clarence Thomas at least knows better. And someday, in some case, that knowledge will make itself felt. Well, I hope he's right. But for the moment at least, Americans who believe in the values of pluralism, Americans who believe in the value of dissent, who believe that government has no business intruding into our private lives, who believe that power in a democracy should be shared and not concentrated, those Americans can no longer look to the Supreme Court to help guard and vindicate those values. And for them, for me, this 200th anniversary of the Bill of Rights is a somber one. So let us hope that when it comes time to celebrate 
what, the 225th anniversary? Maybe sooner. The promise of liberty will again be alive in the land and again be alive in the Supreme Court where it ought to be. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charlie Hinkle. Ringing words indeed. And I think if William Rehnquist was listening, he may be demanding the podium of City Club before long. We'd be glad to have him. The first question to be asked by Chuck Williams, member of the board. Uh, thank you, Jim. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe Charlie told us before uh, his talk began that uh, he was so worked up getting ready for this speech that he was going to be very careful about not overdressing. As a matter of fact, he even threatened to take off his jacket. Um, we thought that was because of all the scholarship that he put into his talk, but as it turns out, I think it's because of all the sex and naked dancing in the, in the talk. I'm ready to take off my coat, too. Um, a more serious question. Um, you talk quite a bit about the issue of, uh, of power and lack of power in society. Uh, many of us on the issue of uh, drug enforcement, for example, get so worked up over the negative influences of, of drugs and the devastating uh, impact on our society. What could be the impact uh, in terms of, of privacy, other Fourth Amendment issues, uh, search and seizure laws, uh, the phone taps, surveillance? Um, what do you see as the impact on this that might not be foreseen by the people who are so uh, vigilant about um, fighting this drug problem? Well, the rights of the criminally accused uh, were one of the major focuses of the, of the Warren Court during the, during the 1960s, and it was one of those issues that really made uh, the right wing in our country see red. You know, they were livid uh, most, uh, about many things about the Warren Court, but I think probably more than anything else, uh, that it was soft on criminals, and that was one of the principles of Nixon's platform. He was going to appoint judges who wouldn't coddle criminals anymore. Um, the irony is, of course, is that when a lot of right-wingers have gotten caught up in the criminal justice system in the last few years, uh, like Oliver North and like a lot of other men who have served in the Reagan and Bush administrations, they suddenly find that the uh, uh, protections for the criminally accused in the Fourth and Fifth Amendments have a lot of uh, virtue to them after all. Um, I, I wish to sort of follow up on a the theme of, of my remarks uh, in connection with what you asked, Chuck. Uh, I wish William uh, Rehnquist sometime would be forced to ride an inner city bus and have the FBI come on and say, okay, Buster, let me open your satchel. I want to see if you've got any marijuana in there. Rehnquist says that's okay. You're, you don't need a search warrant for that. That's not a search and seizure because after all, you're able to get up and walk off the bus whenever you want. He hasn't the faintest idea what it's like to be uh, a migrant worker, a 17-year-old, a 50-year-old, uh, who's riding in an in a inter, uh, intercity Greyhound bus somewhere, uh, confronted with that. FBI agents don't normally come on to the first-class section of uh, United Airlines and ask you know, to, to open your satchel. That only happens in the intercity inter buses. So I, I, again, I think a lot of the decision-making that is going on in the Supreme Court with respect to giving law enforcement agencies more and more power to conduct searches, to conduct wiretaps, to conduct telephone uh, taps even, uh, that reflects, again, an inability to see society, to see reality from anybody's perspective but their own. They don't have their wires tapped. They don't have their luggage searched. Uh, they don't have people spying on them. They don't have people going through their garbage uh, unless they happen to be up for an appointment, and then I guess uh, that happens occasionally. But, but they are not subject to the day-to-day the -day, uh, treadmill of being uh, wrapped up in the criminal justice system. When people are, then they learn its value. And uh, so I, I, my hope is that when people really think about privacy rights, in particular at the workplace, uh, in the school building, uh, students in their lockers, and uh, so on and so forth, when they, when they kind of translate that or apply that those principles of privacy to their own lives, how would they like people coming into their garage or into their workplace, that they will, they will have second thoughts about it. I'm not optimistic, um, but I think our society will pay a dear price for that in the long run. 
Good afternoon, Patrick Donaldson with the uh, Law and, St and Public Safety Standing Committee. Uh, last year, the Congress was unable to pass a, a crime control bill, but it looks like in 1992 session that that, in fact, will come forward. What are your thoughts about the members of uh, Congress uh, attempting to legislate such things as exclusionary rules and other kinds of uh, constitutional matters? Well, that uh, crime bill that's in Congress now has, has uh, almost some, it's like a Christmas tree. It's got something for everybody, enough things that, uh, uh, that, that counteract some of the court's more uh, dismal decisions from a civil liberties point of view that some civil libertarians are supporting it, not the ACLU. Uh, the ACLU is opposed to the crime bill, at least as it was uh, uh, in its incarnation in the last uh, uh, Congress. I don't know what they will do for, for the coming Congress. Uh, one of the things that was positive about it was trying to restore some of the rights of habeas corpus. Uh, trying to overturn some of the court's decision that had severely limited the rights of, of prisoners to go to federal court to ask the federal court to look at the trial court proceedings in the state court and say, listen, I didn't get a fair trial there. My lawyer was incompetent or the, the evidence was uh, illegally seized and so forth. This, the Rehnquist court has uh, virtually eliminated the right of habeas corpus. And one thing that the new bill will do uh, is to restore some measure of the, of the right of habeas corpus in federal court. So that's, from a civil libertarian point of view, a positive approach. The other things that Congress is trying to do are pretty much negatives. Uh, one of the major ones is the vast increase in uh, the death penalty and to federalize a lot of crimes that are now prosecuted only at the local level, more and more of the drug-related crimes, for example. If that bill passes, there will be an enormous increase in, vo in the volume of cases in federal court um, because more and more of these cases will be brought there by federal prosecutors, uh, and there will be more death penalty cases brought in federal court. There has not been any person sentenced to death in a federal court case yet since the death penalty was restored by the Supreme Court 15 or so years ago. If Congress has its way, uh, there will be as many sitting in federal prison on death row as there are in the prisons of Texas. Paul Meyer, member of the club, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Third Circuit uh, ruled uh, that it read the Supreme Court as already having overruled Roe versus Wade. And uh, by some uh, freaky uh, petition by both sides, that case will be before the Supreme Court this term. Uh, can you give us your predictions of what the Supreme Court will do with Roe versus Wade, assuming that they will be forced to decide that squarely? and what impact that may have on the political election in 1992. Well, <laughs> I think one test of neutral principles, one test of judicial integrity, is going to be whether or not the court grants review of that case and, and argues it, has it argued this term. It need not do that. You know, it can decide that it is such a uh, politically uh, unpalatable thing that it is proposing to do that is to say overturn Roe v. Wade, that it will decide to defer that case until after the election. That's my prediction, uh, and that is my fear, uh, that the court will not want to decide, uh, at least uh, to issue a decision that will overturn Roe v. Wade before the 1992 presidential election. So that even if they were to grant review and to hear argument this year, they could very easily, as they often do, set it down for re-argument next year. Uh, decide they want to think more about it. They've done that in a lot of controversial cases over the years, including Brown against Board of Education, the, the original school desegregation decision. So I, my hunch is, uh, well, I, uh, my hunch is, I guess I'll leave it that way, that uh, the court will do everything it can to avoid uh, overruling Roe v. Wade before the presidential election because they don't want, won't want to give that issue to uh, pro-choice uh, political forces in the country. When and if they do decide the case, however, I guess the predictions are virtually unanimous that it will be overturned. Much still does depend, I believe, though, on Clarence Thomas, because Sandra Day O'Connor right now, or before Thomas was appointed, Sandra Day O'Connor was the swing vote on that issue. There were pretty solidly four votes for overturning Roe v. Wade, still four reasonably predictable votes for keeping Roe v. Wade, and Sandra Day O'Connor in the middle. Uh, she has said that she believes that abortion is a liberty interest, uh, that abortion, the right to abortion, the right to choose, does have some constitutional protection. Uh, she hasn't had to decide yet how much, and she has never met yet, I believe, in all the cases that have come to her since she's been on the court, she has never yet voted to strike down any restriction on any right of abortion that she's come across. Nevertheless, she says there still is that kernel there, that, that core principle of some liberty interest attaching to the right to choose with respect to abortion. 
Um, but if Clarence Thomas, so, so the point is that she might still be willing to uphold Roe v. Wade. If Clarence Thomas, on the other hand, even though he didn't even know what Roe v. Wade was evidently, had never, <laughs> had never in, in 18 years as a member of government and uh, a law school student and practicing law had never heard anyone discuss Roe v. Wade, uh, when it finally does come to his attention what that case is, he, 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 may, uh, he may vote to overturn it. And if he does, then it doesn't matter what Sandra Day O'Connor does. Good afternoon, Joanne Allen, City Club member. Uh, nationally, we're at a point now where a lot of liberties that we've taken for granted have been eroding. What I'd like to know, nationally we have a president that got elected using racial tactics. Uh, we have a lot of public officials that are using smear campaigns. What I would like you to talk about is locally, what can we do to reestablish this unity that I think we had a few years back that currently we seem to have lost somewhere along the line? Well, I think that one thing that helped locally was, was the Metzger trial. I believe that bringing Tom Metzger to justice in the city of Portland was a great thing for our society as a whole, but a great thing for Portland. It was a unifying act, uh, allowed us, a lot of people, to, to wake up. It was a wake-up call. Uh, as that phrase is, is uh, being bandied about a lot. But I think in a large sense, the Metzger trial was a wake-up call, much more so than the original uh, heinous murder that led to it. Uh, because the unfortunate fact is that those kinds of racially motivated murders and uh, hate-inspired crimes of any kind don't get as much attention as they should in our society. The legislature has mandated that every city now in the state of Oregon must report on an annual, at least on an annual basis, all the hate-related crimes that occur. I don't think those kinds of statistics get enough publicity. Uh, the, the, the reality of of, of hate-based crimes, whether it's on the basis of, of race or, or gay bashing, which is the other main uh, area of hate-based crime now in our society, those things do not get enough attention. Um, so I think th things like the Metzger trial, when they do bring them to our attention, uh, serve a beneficial uh, uh, role. Uh, there is the Northwest Coalition Against Hate and Violence now. There are groups like that forming and organizing to bring these things to our attention and to keep them there. And I suppose that's what we need. I don't think it means that these are necessarily successful political issues uh, because the Willie Horton kind of campaign is still a successful campaign in this country. Presidential elections, probably Senate elections, pro maybe any kind of, re of election in our society are not won or lost because there's a good candidate who is good on civil liberties issues or on hate issues or on race issues. They're won mainly on economic issues. And so, uh, you know, it, I, I don't see that as a, as a winning campaign strategy. I think it is a matter simply of women and men of conscience and of integrity and of honesty and who believe in the Bill of Rights to speak up and to join organizations like that, to demonstrate, to write letters to the editor, to continue to say to the David Dukes and to the Oregon Citizens Alliance of our society that we don't want your kind of hate politics in our state. Vivian Solomon, City Club member. Following up on uh, the grassroots approach, I'd like to hear your comment on what is or could be happening at the grassroots level to promote the amendments which you suggested at the end of your discussion. <laughs> well, I don't think the legislature is going to rush to pass an, a, a remonstrance uh, to Congress uh, endorsing my views. Uh, I suppose. Uh, you know, there is a group in Eugene right now who, on a somewhat frivolous uh, 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 crusade, has uh, filed an initiative petition that would require amend the Oregon Constitution to require all of us to be normal, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, kind of as an, as an antidote, you know, antidote to the Oregon Citizens Alliance. I guess following up on their strategy, I would suggest that those of us who think the federal constitution should be amended should also file an initiative to that effect, calling on the uh, Oregon Constitution, uh, Oregon legislature to, uh, to uh, call for a constitutional convention that would amend the constitution in this way. Uh, I, I am quite serious about that, though. I mean, I realize that those proposals will probably never be enacted, but I think it would make a tremendous difference if just two of them were enacted.
enacted. The, the idea of, of having every other justice on the Supreme Court be a woman, which would in some years mean that we would have a majority of women on the court, I think would be a tremendous, I, I mean that in all sincerity, a tremendous improvement in our, in our jurisprudence, in our civil libertarian uh, viewpoints, in, in the whole, in, in society in general. And I think that, that uh, the same thing is true with what I said about the U.S. Senate. If every state were required to send one man and one woman to the Senate, think what a difference there would be in our political dialogue, uh, in the, the debate in the Senate over the, everything from Gulf War to the, uh, whether doctors at the, uh, at the local abortion clinics can, or, I mean at the, uh, uh, any health clinic can talk about abortion, uh, the availability of abortion. All of these things would be debated on a different level. They'd have to take a different point of view into, into consideration when they debate these things. I think it would be a tremendously healthy uh, uh, development. Uh, it won't happen by law overnight. It may never happen. And that's why I say, I think in the meantime, white males have to step aside. You know, I would love to be on the Oregon appellate courts someday. I think I'd be a great justice of the Oregon appellate courts. But I hope that if uh, that opportunity ever comes to me, I'd have the guts and the courage and the integrity to say, no, not yet. Let's have a couple more women on that court before you point another comfortable white male to that court. I think that's what male candidates in this society have to do. Let women run for office and let them win office more. We do a better job at that in Oregon than some other states do, but we've got a long way to go. There are more women in our legislature, I suppose, than in most states, but there's still a, a, a vast minority. Let's get a legislature where there are 50% women uh, and, uh, and city, uh, city and county governments and, and statewide offices where women are really working the levers of power over a sustained period of time, not just for a season, not just for one term and then they, they leave office, but for a sustained period of time, what a blossoming of freedom there would be in our society. Joella Whirling Club member. I should probably let a man come to the microphone right now. <laughs> um, I'm going to ask you this question anyway, Charlie, and I'm sorry that I didn't uh, read up on the question that I want to ask you about. But there is an Oregon Citizens Alliance um, petition right now that is being circulated that would ask uh, that, uh, as I understand it, that local government or that, yes, that local governments not give preferential treatment um, to homosexuals. And somewhere wrapped in all that language is also um, uh, pedophiles, um, bestiality. I mean, I, I can't really remember exactly how it's all linked together. But I'm not satisfied at the approach that we just simply don't sign such a petition. Um, that I'm, I'm wondering what we can do in this kind of, in this community, uh, in the spirit of the kinds of things you've been talking about, uh, to be more proactive than that, to, I realize we can't stop that kind of petition from being circulated, but what else can we do? I mean, that's, that's a very difficult kind of thing to be confronted with. Well, I'm gratified uh, about the, uh, at the number of community leaders uh, and leaders of the religious communities in particular that have already spoken out on that. Uh, not only uh, the ecumenical ministries, which, uh, whose board uh, unanimously passed a resolution condemning this new OCA initiative, and not only the Bishop of the Roman Catholic Church in Oregon, which surprised many of us, who's also come out very strongly against this OCA initiative, but even the Salt Shakers, that, that group of evangelical uh, conservative Protestants who have uh, uh, been uh, antagonistic to gay rights legislation in the past, uh, they too have said that this OCA initiative goes too far and it should be defeated and they are encouraging their members not to sign it. It is a question of public education, Joella, and public education comes through the moral and intellectual and uh, spiritual leadership of people like those I have just mentioned. If people are willing to speak, to write letters to the editor, to uh, endorse resolutions like the one that the ecumenical ministries passed, if they're willing to have them read in their churches and, the, and in their synagogues, if they're willing to bring them up for discussion at their clubs, their Rotary, their Elks Club, uh, their civic uh, organizations, the City Club. I'm so happy you brought it up, uh, Joella. I think, I, I mean, you, you answer your own question in, some, in, in a very uh, important way because you, the more that uh, you know, Justice Brandeis said 50 years ago, sunlight is the best disinfectant. The more you turn over the rocks and let the sunlight hit the OCA and hit its campaign of hatred and bigotry, the more people will, will respond uh, against it. 
the more they understand what the OCA, OCA is really up to. And I don't mean to say that every member or that any member of the OCA themselves are, are prejudiced or harbor any bigotry, but what I do say is that measures that are promoted by that group do foster a climate of bigotry. They do make it easier for people to engage in gay bashing. They do make it easier for people in employment situations to say that person is a second class citizen. They make it easier for hate to flourish even if they are not engaged in it themselves. So I think that men and women of goodwill who simply are willing to stand up and to say in every situation at your holiday cocktail parties uh, to the city club meetings, say this is something I disagree with, I won't stand for it in my community. If you just speak, that is the best answer to ignorance and to stupidity, to speak up. I am afraid our time has expired, but I want to give our thanks again to Charlie Hinkle for a wonderful presentation today, much to think about, and we're adjourned. <laughs>